Welcome to Naked Reflections, brought to you from the Wolf Institute. I'm Ed Kessler, and each week I'll be taking an in-depth look at the stories reported by our friends over at the Naked Scientists. What does the latest scientific stuff mean for the rest of us? Stay with us and find out. For many years, three friends meet daily in Jerusalem for coffee. Over time, they become more and more pessimistic, noticing the increase in conflict, poor economic performance, and a reduction in the number of tourists. One day, one of them announces that he's converted. What? The other two exclaim, yes, he says, I've converted from being a pessimist to an optimist. A few minutes later, one of the pessimists turns to the newly converted optimist and says to him, if you've become an optimist, why do you still look so worried? Ah, his friend replies, do you think it's easy to be an optimist? Perhaps after all, rational pessimism would be the best way for our putative coffee drinker to go. The trouble is, rational pessimism can be a night's move from perpetual negativity, anxiety and ultimately despair. We're talking about the troubled mind this week, or to put it more positively, about how to achieve mental well-being. When it comes to neuroscience, the theory that depression is linked to failures in the immune system has gained some traction. Here's Declan Jones of Johnson & Johnson speaking in the Naked Scientist show, Brain on Fire. What is the role of the immune system? How can we demonstrate perhaps that there really are robust signals of immune changes in depressed patients, but also can we distinguish between depressed patients who respond well to antidepressant drugs and those who perhaps who don't. So can we actually identify blood markers that would be able to help us to identify the right patients to put into a clinical trial? And then as a separate piece of work, we're trying to understand what are the best molecules to test so that at the end we may be able to do a therapeutic proof of concept trial in the right patients using the right molecule. With me to discuss the troubled mind are Reverend Ruth Adams, pastoral tutor at Ridley Hall in Cambridge, Ruth grew up in Belfast during the Troubles and is especially interested in conflict transformation and resilience. She's been involved with mental health as a college chaplain, a minister of religion, and latterly as a mediator. Joining Ruth is social psychologist Dr. Kitty Alone, a regular on Naked Reflections, a research fellow here at the Wolf Institute, amongst other areas of interest, Kitty focuses on the cognitive science of religion and morality. Well, Welcome to you both. Ruth, tell us about your approach to working with people in intense conflict and how thinking about the impact of the conflict on their mental health can help. I noticed when I started working as a mediator um, was that you had to do quite a lot of work with people first before you could actually get to the basis about the conflict. Because actually in the middle of intense conflict, something happens to people's brains. Now I'm not a neuroscientist, but it was really obvious that people weren't operating as they would fully like to. So their well-being, mental well-being was definitely down. They would talk about things like not sleeping well, not eating. They would talk about the fact that the conflict was dominating their minds. It was in a way for them, it was kind of an irritation. It was like, I just want to get this out of my mind. But ironically, before any of that, they, the, the best thing to do is actually some physiological stuff, get them to breathe deeply, to, you know, to relax, asking them about themselves, who they are. And then once they'd kind of inhabited a better mental space, they were actually able to deal with the conflict. And, and in the end, dealing with the conflict is the only way to get rid of it anyway. So, Kitty, from a moral psychology perspective, where does mental well-being come in? Is there a connection between morality and mental health? Well, that's a really interesting area of research. So one of the things that I was interested in when I studied in Belfast was the idea that certain symptoms of mental health disorder can be moralised. So in the absence of a medical explanation, which sort of defines Um, abnormality in somatic terms, people will moralise their symptoms. So that is to say that, for example, something like recurrent intrusive thoughts, which are the hallmark of something like OCD, for example, people will determine them to be indicative of a flawed, immoral personality. I must be having these bad recurrent thoughts because I am a bad person. This moralised view of mental health has certainly been something that's quite intuitive to mankind and has been seen across the centuries in the way that people conceptualise and deal with mental illness. 
nowadays there is a much more sort of medicalized conception of it that is the trend is something more along the lines of to see mental health as something as a biochemical or somatic disorder rather than sort of an inherent personality flaw so yes there is a link between morality and mental illness in the common psyche i would say the thing that i was thinking as kiddie was talking was around uh, what tends to happen in conflict again in the way it's moralized so that's often linked to sin and when people are feeling bad and are often having difficult mental health because of the conflict they'll often decide it's because what's going on is sinful they may not decide that they are the ones who are sinful they may think it's actually the other but they will certainly link the mental illness with some kind of moral lack that's going on something is wrong and I'm feeling it in this particular way, therefore it must be that this person is wrong or this situation is wrong. And if only this situation would change, then everything would be fine. If you're dealing with somebody who feels there's something existential or essential about the sinful condition of the other or themselves, presumably you tackle it as much from a theological or pastoral perspective as you do any other? I think actually I'd probably go pastoral first. (laughs) So a lot of good listening helping people to to speak about what's actually going on for them to feel understood and that in itself often will de-escalate somebody's thinking and that they will be able to be a bit more rational and then they will be able to talk a bit about their own mental health actually and so usually it works like this there's some listening there's some feeling understood (laughs) there's some people sit back in their chair a bit more there's less anxiety and less kind of really agitation and then they will actually say actually I've not been feeling great (laughs) And actually then it's about what's that been and how are you looking after yourself? And that massively is, yeah, the pastoral first, always, very much so. Kitty, the way Ruth's describing it is almost like an illness, if you like. And I wonder from a a social psychological perspective whether it's contagious to other people who are there. In other words, is there impact in the social circles of those who are either suffering from mental illness or I suppose, on the other hand, will positive mental health be contagious? Well, now that is absolutely fascinating. And this is something that we see quite often in the literature, not only the scientific literature, but also the artistic literature as well. This idea that madness could somehow be contagious. The first thing that I think of is a very rare psychiatric syndrome called folie à deux, which literally means madness of two. It's most commonly used in reference to sort of um, various uh, sort of true crime cases. So, for example, the Papin sisters in Paris in the 1900s had this shared delusion, and that's the essence of this syndrome. For those of you who are interested in a more sort of recent occurrence of this, there's a fantastic documentary, I think it was on the BBC, called Madness in the Fast Lane, about a pair of Swedish twins who have this very rare psychiatric syndrome, folie à deux. So they have this shared madness. And what happens is there tends to be one dominant person in the dyad, the one that the, the delusion starts in. And this, through whatever process it is, sort of transmits or manages to spread to another person so that they end up sharing this delusion. That's certainly within the context of a dyad of two people. The question of whether madness can operate at a collective level is something that's occupied thinkers, writers, authors, artists for centuries. The classic example, I guess, and some, somebody like Freud sort of pointed to this quite early on, was, well, is faith delusional? In his Moses and Monotheism, he stated that belief in a single God is indeed delusional. William James, father of modern psychology, was quite clear on the fact that there is a distinction between spiritual and psychotic experiences, that they are broadly distinguishable. But for people like the hardcore militant atheists like Richard Dawkins, for example, he's very sort of convinced that religion is a delusion shared by a community. But of course, if your definition of a delusion is something that is outside what is socially and culturally bounded, then actually it makes me think, well, in that case, atheism would be the delusion rather than religion but I don't think Dawkins um, talks about that very much. So help us here, Ruth. Kitty's offered some examples from research. In your actual hands-on experience, what are the issues in terms of the individual pressures and the communal pressures when it comes to conflict and mental health? Uh, Kitty was talking, I was reflecting about how you can see anxiety travelling in a group. And I was just thinking of particular experiences I've had in trying to facilitate a group of people who are very disturbed, I would say not because they're individual mental illness, but because of something that's been happening to them as a community. You can watch a wave of anxiety, whether that's anger or fear, 
travel across the group. You can physically see it happening in people's faces and their body language. What's quite interesting is, is how you then deal with that. <laughs> so if you're facilitating that, what do you then do in order to change that dynamic? So the thing that doesn't work is to be very strong in authority and to tell everyone to be quiet <laughs> and to behave themselves. But usually you can find within the group that there are several individuals who are kind of fed up about what's happening and also able to stand at a bit of distance from what's happening, even while they're in the midst of it. And if you can engage them in the situation, they're going to have much of a stronger pool with their peers anyway. Quite often I've found myself using that as a tool in a situation like that where I've said, is this working for everybody? And some people have said, no, it's not working for us. We need to stop. And it's that kind of really interesting thing of those people, even when they're in a group, you can still see themselves as an individual with agency. And somehow they're not being as affected by the anxiety. And that there's a lot of work we do in conflict resilience to think with leaders about how do we build that resilience up in individuals? And how do we create more people like that in every organisation? When you're facing a conflict situation, Ruth, and there are so many going on right now as we speak in different parts of the world. And when there's been this sort of this collapse of hope, perhaps, and we've fallen into the negative stereotypes of the other. Where do you start? Um, I'm thinking of the example you gave about the sort of wave of anguish or anxiety crossing numerous people. How else would you handle that situation? Uh, there's an element of where you can't stop a wave. <laughs> if you break it, it just breaks against you. So I have noticed that when you try and stop it too much, you just get all of that anxiety then thrown at you. While not being awful isn't particularly pleasant as an experience and not necessarily useful to the group because you just then you become a new enemy. And it's certainly the experience of mediators that you can easily become the enemy when you <laughs> and that, that then means you're not really doing your job because you're not sort of an honest broker and giving freedom to everybody, which is and safety. So I suppose creating safety is actually the thing. So a bit of letting things run, but only in as far as they're actually going to help people come to a pause, come to a breath, you know, a bit like things are really intense and then there's a pause. <laughs> and then you can say, asking people questions like, what would help you be safe at the minute? What makes you feel safe? And um, those sorts of questions are really useful. Getting people to do things like draw a timeline of how they experience their enemy's life to be is really helpful. It's a very quick immersion into trying to help. So essentially what you're trying to do is help, and I think this is linked to mental well-being, trying to get people to pull out of their own centrality of their own experience and the sort of the intensity of the emotionality and somehow take a bit more of a balcony view, you know, so they can suddenly understand there's a lot of other people involved. And that, again, I think just re-engages those parts of the brain that haven't been being used in the conflict, which are all about, you know, fighting or freezing or, you know, that kind of response. And you're starting to get them to tell stories about the other, to imagine the other, to draw a picture, you know, it, it's whatever it takes, but it's always about that principle of helping people to draw back and reclaim responsibility for their own lives, actually. And that and the thing is makes people feel safe, I think, once they feel that they're fully who they are. Kitty, I wonder if you could come in on that in terms of your own research, you know, with the transference of interfaith and, and trying to understand the other. As Ruth was speaking, I was thinking about your own research in terms of transference, if you like. The concept of empathy and being able to see the other as like a psychologically complex being rather than just, you know, an essentialized bad character is, is extremely important for effective interfaith work and of all the people that I've spoken to in the research for the Measures of Success project they all said that the cultivation of empathy was one of the most crucial things for interfaith and if anything it is sort of the foundation upon which everything else follows that you have to be able to envisage the other as capable of happiness sadness and as Ruth was saying sort of exercises that force you to think about those things are extremely useful and effective in facilitating dialogue. This is Naked Reflections with me, Ed Kessler, and I'm discussing the troubled mind with my guests, Ruth Adams and Kitty Alone. We all forget stuff and we all misremember, as Hillary Clinton once graphically stated, but is there any way that neuroscience can establish whether a memory is false or accurate? Here's James Ost in the Naked Scientist show, Alzheimer's the brain and memory. So psychologists at the moment are kind of looking at a number of techniques to see if there are any, if you like, kind of clear markers of what one might call true recall versus what one might call false recall. Okay, um, But even at the kind of, even at that kind of psychophysiological kind of cellular level, 
it's it's almost impossible to distinguish these things. People have um, looked at people remembering real things and people remembering imagined things, and essentially measured their brain waves, if you like, and, and compared the two. And really, any any differences are very very short lived and disappear within a matter of kind of seconds. I want to explore the question of memory, because of course this misremembering or this perceived memory weighs very heavily, particularly when there are conflicts many generations old. Of course, your time in uh, Belfast with, during the Troubles, Ruth, comes straight to mind. But there are other conflicts, and I'm thinking particularly the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that go back decades, if not more than 100 years. And memories are very much part of conflict resolution. Does your work deal with that? Sometimes it deals with it because I'm involved with churches and communities where previous conflicts are actually feeding into the current one. And a bit like with families, churches and organisations have that history. It's not always known, interestingly, it's not always known about by present people, but actually I do a lot of work understanding the history. One of the things we do is timelines and we get people to write a timeline of what their church's life has been and then do it from different people's perspectives, like I said before. But one of the things that that will help them think about is oh, my memory is different <laughs> than this other person's memory. You know, the thing that was important to me was this thing, the opening of this hole. The thing that was important to them was actually that. It's a sort of a re-understanding of the past that can kind of somehow be very creative then in, in the future. The other thing I was thinking about was fixed narrative in particular. And the more we tell a story, the more it stays as the history. <laughs> it becomes the definitive history. I remember when I was at school, I, did, I had an amazing Irish history teacher when I was 18. Our class was mixed Protestants and Catholics for sixth form in Belfast. And this would have been in the 80s. He just said a date to us. Uh, so he just said, right, 1916, what does anybody think? And people said lots of different things. And then he said, 1921, what does anybody think? I suddenly realised that we all had different stories and we were very definite in the way that you are when you're 18 that this was the right story <laughs> and it was a brilliant way to start an A-level in Irish history all about that sort of misremembering or the remembering in a particular way and I'm involved at the minute actually the Corrie Miller community is doing this wonderful programme called Decade of Centenaries and I'm doing it on Zoom and with people from all around Ireland looking at how we tell the story of the same time, but tell it so differently. Kitty, if bad stuff happens to people, isn't depression a natural thing? Well, Ed, that is a fantastic question. And I think the emotional experience of feeling sad is definitely a human universal. Everybody feels sad in response to a tragedy or to a death, for example. Where it becomes problematic and potentially and what we might classify something as mental illness is when it becomes prolonged to the point that it interferes and disrupts daily functioning. So what is really of huge interest to researchers everywhere at the moment, of course, is the rise of mental health, particularly depression in response to COVID-19. So one of the things that's become clear is that there is going to be a huge rise in what psychiatrists and clinicians call prolonged grief disorder. So what the pandemic has done has disrupted the way that people naturally grieve, say goodbye to the dying, and it's disrupted the social foundations of grieving. So the rituals that have for thousands of years been an important part of coming to terms with somebody dying have been disrupted. And this is going to have a massive knock-on effect, not only with prolonged grief, but also with depression, well-being, and all other sort of host of other mental illnesses. Taking the COVID question, Ruth, I'm just wondering in your world of conflict resolution and mediation, how you manage virtually. We've spoken to psychiatrists who are dealing with patients, they're one-to-one, -one, but when you're dealing with conflict resolution, particularly in a community, and you can't physically be there and see the little, the waves of anxiety, as you've put it earlier, what tactics are there managing it from a distance? A colleague of mine was observing that there's something about actually picking one person out on Zoom that feels quite confrontational in a way that it doesn't necessarily have to if you're in a, in a room of people. You can just sort of nod over to somebody, they'll catch your eye, they'll know that you're at, <laughs> attaching them. So it's less nuanced. And I think nuance is actually really important in facilitation work, and particularly when people are already feeling quite jagged, if you understand what I mean by that, and have rough edges. 
and are quite raw, actually, because the conflict does have huge impact on people's mental health. It's undeniable. And what you really want to do is it be kind of soothing in some ways, kind of calming. And so I'm not sure I've yet found completely a, a good way to do calming. Maybe sometimes using pictures or music or space are the ways that I would try to do it, actually, rather than what I say. But certainly losing body language is a huge, huge issue. In my experience, when you're with people, telling a joke, as I did at the beginning, can fall completely flat when you're just telling it to a computer screen, right? But when you make mistakes, that somehow punctures a little bit of the anxiety because you've made a little bit of a fool yourself, (laughs) of yourself. That sort of helps. I'm wondering also whether building resilience, which again is something that I know you, Ruth, are particularly interested in. I guess it starts with the individual and extends to the community. Yes, definitely. And it starts sometimes with the most resilient people already. In a conflict, it can be tempting to try and deal with the people who are fighting first, but actually what works better is to deal with the people who are already quite resilient. And if you build up their resilience even more, that actually then impacts everybody else. So yeah, good work with individuals is crucial, I think, and allowing them to start to be able to challenge some norms of their community with the way their culture is working. Because often conflict is endemic because of particular rules of the culture. (laughs) of the community and so actually the more resilient people are the more they're able to challenge and say should we be behaving like this why are we doing this and actually it's always better if people inside a community do the challenging it's much more likely that they learn there's transformation and kitty what about the question of self-deception because one of the challenges i find engaging in whether it's interfaith dialogue or conflict resolution is the sense that the other is deceiving him or herself about something But of course, if that's their perception, then that's the reality we have to deal with. I'm just wondering if there are any tactics or suggestions you have as a social psychologist or shed any light on this question of self-deception. So if we think about, for example, the psychological background or the foundation to something like conflict resolution or interfaith dialogue, it's generally thought to be contact theory, sort of developed by Allport in the 1950s and has widely been used and sort of informs a lot of research and policy into sort of intergroup dynamics and this idea of self-deception that the other is deceived and that you are correct this is something that I think can be tackled head-on once people from different groups are brought together physically in the same space there's something very profound about meeting the other in sort of a facilitated or controlled environment suddenly that when it works that notion of they are deceived and I'm right, it sort of melts away because you see the other person as an individual rather than an exemplar of their group, for example. So again, this is interesting because it raises the question, well, how do we get that experience through virtual contact? So in an age where there's the world is in the grips of a pandemic, how do you get that experience of breaking down the other of another individual through virtual contact when you can't physically see somebody. There's not the possibility of actual physical touch. It's something that we're having to work very hard at and very, very quickly because it's happened quicker than the research can catch up with it. And again, it comes back to this idea of empathy, that when you see somebody physically, when you meet them on the same level as yourself from a different group, who are perhaps the narrative within your own community is that they are a member of the enemy, for example, When you meet them as a fellow human being in a very controlled environment, you can't help but see that person as another human being. And it's interesting what you said about humour, because that often is a great leveller. I know that some of the work that The Wolf does has been interested in this idea of the levelling power of humour, particularly in interfaith dialogue. When it works, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, That just made me think a little bit about playfulness, actually, because I use playfulness all the time in conflict work. And it's definitely harder to do that virtually. But you can still do it, I think. But there's always a risk with playfulness that you're going to come across as making fun of the other. I want to end by exploring the question of whether we need to have gone through the same experience that those we're working with are facing. You, Ruth, I'm sure have gone through, been living in a conflict zone and therefore had that personal experience Is that necessary? And when we're dealing with questions of the troubled mind and depression, are we better equipped to help and mediate and engage if we've also had to go through that sort of experience? I'm not sure if it's necessary, Ed, but I certainly think it's helpful 
what's quite interesting is people will often be able to tell if you've been through a similar experience or at least understand and you won't be saying anything, but they will just somehow get that. And that does seem to help make people feel more relaxed. I think if you're less other than somebody else, it always helps them. I do all sorts of things in life that I have no experience of. I marry people and I'm not married, for example. That's a a kind of clear one. And I think people have enjoyed me doing the marriage ceremony (laughs) in spite of me not being married. But I have found other ways to connect with them, to share stories with them, to relate together. So I think it's the relationships that we have with others where we're allying ourselves together with them. So we're both facing in the same direction. I think that for me, that's the most important thing Uh, because we're never going to have experienced everything that someone else has. And even if we've experienced something similar, I suppose what I have learned, particularly in learning how to listen well, (laughs) which I always thought that I was very good at, by the way. And then when I started doing mediation, I realized I really wasn't. I think what I've learned is that even if I think I understand, I usually don't. And actually the best thing to do is just to listen and to keep listening and ask more questions. And that in the end makes somebody feel that you identify with them. I think that's the most fundamental way. If someone is truly heard and seen, that's going to be the most creative thing for them. This really ties in with one of my particular research interests at The Wolf, this idea of legacy in post-conflict societies and who determines what the narrative is, because ultimately who determines what the narrative is will determine what the legacy is. Post-conflict societies are interesting because, particularly in places like Bosnia and Northern Ireland, we've got to the point now where there's a whole generation who did not experience firsthand the conflict. They've grown up on secondhand testimony, they've grown up on narrative, they've grown up on sort of collective memory. So it's extremely interesting, this idea of, and again, I think it does come back to collective memory and narrative, how this feeds into how the post-conflict generation sort of determines its legacy and determines its identity within its post-conflict framework. Is it more powerful to listen to the testimony of somebody who actually experienced conflict, or is it more powerful to listen to the collective narrative that is said over and over again within your community. And there's something extremely seductive about narrative that human beings are particularly susceptible to. Once we get to the point, for example, with Holocaust survivors, once that generation dies out, what you're left with is the narrative rather than the first-hand experience. Let's hold on to those thoughts. Thank you for listening and thanks to my guests, Ruth Adams and Kitty Alone. We'd love to hear from you at Naked Reflections. You can contact us at the Wolf Institute by email or on Facebook or Twitter. Let us know what you think of the show. You can catch up with all the subjects we've covered by delving into our back catalogue of more than 70 editions. And given the recent violence in the region, it's worth checking out our new podcast, The A to Z of the Holy Land, from Arab to Zion. You can also find the Naked Reflections podcast at nakedscientist.com reflections or wherever you get your podcasts. I'll be back next week with some more guests.